Sometimes, I just need a little motivation to decide what to brew. Well, a few months ago, I saw some posts on Instagram about the Brave Noise Pale Ale. So brewing a hazy pale ale, that sounded pretty good to me. Helping out a cause like the Brave Noise, well, I'm in for that too. So I went ahead and brewed a partial mash version of the recipe. It turned out pretty good. Well, let's get brewing. Oh, welcome. This is Brent from Cascades Homebrew. So I want to start off giving a little attention to the Brave Noise effort. So it started off with a question from Rian Allen. Have you ever experienced sexism in the beer industry? So it grew from there to shine a spotlight on gender discrimination, racism, sexual assault, and harassment, especially in the brewing industry. So if you haven't noticed, I'm a white guy. I hit most of the stereotypes for your typical home brewer. So I don't work in the beer industry, but I do attend homebrew clubs. When I look around, I see a lot of people there that look a lot like me. So I think diversity in the homebrewing club should mean more than just do I have facial hair or do I have hair on my head? So it might be that the homebrewing hobby or homebrewing clubs is kind of attract geeky white guys like me more than other people, and I do think that is part of it. But when I attend various pubs, breweries, or festivals, I see a lot more diversity there than I see in the homebrewing clubs. So my message in the theme of Brave Noise is if you're a homebrewer or you're part of a homebrew club, think about ways that you can encourage diversity. So make sure you and your club are open to minorities and women, and also treat new members with the respect they deserve. So I'll put some links down in the description about the Brave Noise Project. Also, at the end of this video, I'll put a link to a playlist, some other brewers, and some other information on the Brave Noise Pale Ale. So let's talk about brewing some beer. So I went ahead and I submitted my request to the Brave Noise Effort, and they sent me back a packet. It included recipes for the homebrew version, both in all grain and extract. I'm always looking for some kind of investigative idea to try something out. I thought about doing an all grain versus extract shootout. That one might be something in the future. But looking at the recipe for this one and the use of flake oats made me think this was a good one for a steep versus partial mash. So I hope to put together a video to dig in more about the steeping versus partial mash. This one is really just talking about the partial mash version that I brewed. So I'm going to evaluate my home brewed version and I'm also going to test it against the commercial version. When I was up in Michigan over Thanksgiving, I stopped by Holmes Brewery in Ann Arbor. They had the Brave Noise Pale Ale on tap. So I drank a glass when I was there, and I also brought home a four-pack. Their recipe is a little different than the base one. There's measures in at 6.2%. The base recipe called for about 4.8%. And also, based on the information on their website, it looks like they use Motueka in the dry hop as well, which is not part of the base recipe. Well, let me get into how I brewed this beer, then we'll come back and we'll drink mine, and we'll compare it to the Brave Noise Pale Ale from Holmes. This beer is a partial mash. Actually, this is my very first time ever brewing a partial mash. I want to put out a video talking about partial mashes more in depth, but essentially, I conducted a mini mash, but the majority of the fermentals still come from the dry malt extract. To start, I treated the full three gallons or 11.3 liters of water with a bit of Campton tablet to remove chloramines. I then measured off a half a gallon of water, about 1.9 liters, this is the water that's going to be needed for the partial mash. I then heated up that water to 197 degrees Fahrenheit or 82 degrees Celsius to hit my target mash temperature of 152 degrees Fahrenheit or 67 degrees Celsius. I won't go into too depth with water chemistry changes here, but I treated the mash water with just over 2 grams of calcium chloride. This was partially to boost the chloride levels in the beer, but also the boost in calcium combined with the thicker mash should in theory help get my pH into a better range. I'm not sure how critical pH is with a partial mash. I didn't even measure my mash pH anyway. I mashed this in my two gallon beverage cooler that I had preheated by filling with hot tap water. The partial mash fermentables were eight ounces or 225 grams of flaked oats, another eight ounces or 225 grams of malted wheat, 7 ounces or 200 grams of a 15 Levabon crystal malt. Note, the wheat malt here provides the enzymes with a critical conversion of starches into sugars during the mash. I simply added the grains into the small grain bag, added the hot water into the grains, and then gave it a good stir. I measured a starting mash temperature just over 154 degrees Fahrenheit or 68 degrees Celsius. Oh, that's a fine temp. I think with this thermometer often read a degree or two higher than actual temps anyways. I then sealed up the cooler and set it aside for the 30 minute mash. Iodine is often used to test for starch conversion. At the start of the mash, a drop of iodine turns a dark purple 
indicating the presence of starches. After the 30 minute mash, I opened up the cooler and gave the mash a good stir. I measured a post mash temperature of right around 150 degrees Fahrenheit or 65 and a half degrees Celsius. That is right in the ideal temperature range for mashing. I'd been heating up the remainder of the water on the stove. I'm not positive what the temperature was here, but my target would have been to heat the water up to around 170 degrees Fahrenheit or 77 degrees Celsius. I then dunked the grain bag into the warm water to extract more of the sugars and flavors. There ended up being very little liquid left in the cooler when the mash was done. I guess the flaked oats really sucked up a lot of water. I probably would have been better off using closer to 2 gallons or 4 liters of water for the mash. The extra water would also help to keep the mash temperature more stable. I measured just around 3 gallons or 11.3 liters of pre-boil volume. That was right on target, looking good so far. Another test with iodine post mash shows mostly just the dark brown color of the iodine. I do see a little bit of dark purple streaks indicating that maybe I didn't get full conversion during the 30 minute mash. I turn off the heat to the pot and I add in the two pounds or 910 grams of pills and light dry malt extract. I give the extract a good stir, making sure to mix in any clumps before turning the heat back on. I brought the wort up to a boil and then I set a timer for just 10 minutes. Keep in mind, this recipe does not call for any hop additions during the boil, so I just went for a 10 minute one. The first hop additions will be a steep at around 180 degrees Fahrenheit or 82 degrees Celsius. I drop the temperature from boiling temps just using a simple water bath in my kitchen sink. Once I've hit my 180 degrees Fahrenheit or 82 degrees Celsius target, I added my first addition of hops. It's only one ounce addition of mosaic, which Beersmith calculates to give 12 IBUs. This seems like a very small amount, especially for a hoppy beer. Actually, the published Brave Noise Pale Ale recipe, scaled to my batch size, would have called for only a quarter ounce of mosaic and a quarter ounce of sabro. I doubled that amount, but my homebrew shop only had two packs of sabro in stock, so I just went with the mosaic here. I then chilled the wort down to pitching temps, first by circulating tap water through my immersion chiller, then switching over to circulate ice water. I snagged a gravity reading, which came out at 10.43. Eh, just a few points under my target of 10.49. I guess that's not too bad for my first try at a partial mash. I then transferred the wort into the fermenter, using a strainer to filter out most of the hop debris. Even though this batch didn't get much hops and the hot side, it's still worth filtering them out in my mind. My volume into the fermenter was very close to my target of 2.6 gallons, or 9.8 liters, maybe just a touch over. I then went ahead and pitched half a pack of Lalamon Verdant Yeast. I seem to have not recorded many notes on fermentation for this batch. I started out the fermentation at 66 degrees Fahrenheit, around 19 degrees Celsius. I think I boosted the temperature up probably to around 72 degrees Fahrenheit, or 22 degrees Celsius to finish up. The batch sat in my chamber for a little extra time while I was out of town for Thanksgiving. When I got back, I lowered the temperature down to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, or just under 16 degrees Celsius, and added the dry hops on day 20. The dry hops for this batch were one ounce or 28 grams of both mosaic and sabro. You have to check back later to learn more about the two versions of this recipe that I brewed. I recently picked up this small stainless steel funnel to help me dry hop. It seems to work pretty well. I then did a closed transfer into a purge keg Looking at the estimated versus actual stats for this batch, the original gravity was predicted to be 1049 and I came in at 1043. Final gravity was predicted at 1012 and I was just under that at 1010. So the ABV of predicted 4.8 came out at 4.3%. So I think I probably overestimated the efficiency of the partial mash. I'll have to take that into account next time. A few months ago, I acquired a second pair of the 10 liter torpedo kegs from a friend. Now I can technically have five beers on tap. Well, except I only have four CO2 lines. Uh, this is the first time I had all four of the torpedo kegs in use. All right, so there we are. There's my version of the Brave Noise Pale Ale. It's a wonderful looking beer. Let me zoom in on the camera. Beers always tend to come out on the camera a little darker than what they look like in person. It's a wonderful looking beer. I would say, it, I would call it a light golden color. So full disclosure, I did record a tasting of this beer on December 31st, New Year's Eve. It was a two-part. I filmed two videos that day. The first one turned out pretty well. 
I was trying some different microphone settings. For some reason I was getting a lot of hum in the background on the second video. So I think the hum was a kind of a combination of my laptop and I think a lot of it was coming from my beer fridge that makes a little bit of noise. So that microphone may not be the best one for me. So I'm back to trying the lapel microphone. So that means I need to drink beer again. Boy, it's tough being a YouTube star, isn't it? I did go ahead and take some notes from that first tasting, just to kind of speed it along. Like I said, for appearance, I get a nice light golden color. It's got a nice white head that sticks around. It's really a pretty looking beer. Some New England IPA just can be a little lighter. It's got a little bit of crystal in the, in the bill. And then also, you know, it's made with extract, but it's a really nice looking beer. Even with some delays in getting to filming this, it's still got a nice haze that's been sticking around. If we go in for aroma, so it, gets, it got very nice hop aroma. It's a really nice smelling beer. I mean, it's definitely dominated by what I think is the Sabro. I've not brewed the Sabro before, but I've had several commercial beers that have Sabro listed as ingredient. A common descriptor for Sabro is, is coconut. I do get some coconut, but I get a lot of other flavors. You know, looking at some of the descriptors of Sabro. So if I look up a descriptor for Sabro, I see Sabro is an aroma hop that is notable for its complexity of fruity and citrus flavors. It imparts distinct tangerine, coconut, tropical fruit, and stone fruit aromas with hints of cedar, mint, and cream. So out of those, I definitely get some of the coconut, some tropical fruit from this, whether that's some of that from the mosaic or that's from the Sabro. Descriptor of cedar is kind of an interesting one, and I can definitely get something that I would say is sort of a cedar, piney kind of thing. Mint, I don't know about mint, and I'm not quite sure what cream is in a hop. So going in for a taste, I get a lot of the same that I get on the aroma. A lot of really nice hop flavors. It's really got a nice hop punch to it. So I get those hints of the coconut. I get the tropical fruit is there quite a bit. I also could get what they call cedar. Descriptor of cedar, it sounds kind of odd for a beer. But it's actually pretty good. So as far as the malt bill on this and the grain, I think it's got a really nice flavor. Now this is an extract beer, this partial Nash. I don't get any flaws that I would attribute to, uh, you know, lack of complexity from being dry malt extract. So I think it kind of shows with quality extract, you can make a pretty good hazy IPA or hazy pale ale. And then as far as the mouth bill on this, I would say it's got a medium. You know, it's only a 4.3% ABV beer. I would say the body is kind of in line with what you would expect. So it's not a big, thick New England IPA. Nobody's going to give you this and think it's a 7.5% beer. But it does pull its weight pretty good for a 4.3% beer. So I think if I brewed it again, I'd try to get the gravity up a little bit more. I think that would boost a little bit of the mouthfeel up to where I would want it to be. The beer's got a lot of full hop character, but it doesn't have the hop astringency. The bitterness level on it is, is pretty appropriate. It's about light. So that's kind of interesting just because it doesn't have any boil hops at all just either whirlpool or dry hops. Sometimes I've had those beers and they felt kind of unbalanced without the bitterness. This one I think it's got a nice level of bitterness for the malt backbone. So this one, it's got just a touch of bitterness to kind of balance it out, but it's a very light bitterness beer. Ideas moving forward. I mentioned I might try to boost up the original gravity a little bit if I brewed this again. I've also heard some recommendations of Sabro that it works best as an accent hop, maybe in like 20% of the hops in the bill. And I think that would be the case here. I think the Sabro kind of dominates the, the character. So if you really like Sabro, go for it. Go for even a 100% Sabro. In my case, I think it just like a Sabro in a supporting role, add in that kind of tropical coconutty flavor, along with some other hops that add in a lot of tropical flavors. I have some Brew One. I'm looking forward to doing a Brew One Sabro combination. So luckily, even though I did the tasting here a week or so ago, I had another can, so I can do another tasting. Yeah. Let's go ahead and crack this boy open, take a look at it, and see how it compares to mine. Alright. So we bring the two beers together. So here's my homebrewed version. Homebrew version is def is the homebrew version has a more haze to it. The color, the color on both of them is very similar. The Holmes one is probably just a little lighter golden color, a little brighter, just because it doesn't have the haze there. If we go in for aroma on the two, ooh. So I mentioned on the website for Holmes, they said they used some Otweka hops there in the dry hop as well. We're mindful of the recipe a little closer, and the dry hop was just 50% mosaic, 50% sabro. 
So it does feel like the Holmes one has a little bit more of a complex hop flavor, a little bit more of a balance with some tropical, a lot of like kind of pineapple notes that I don't get in mind. It's got the Sabro is there and you get the coconut. So I kind of feel in maybe a lighter amount, you get a little bit more of that coconut. Let's go in for some taste here. Really nice. So it's got the same, I love to get on the aroma, just a lot of complex hop flavors. I think it's got a really nice balance with the tropical fruit in there. You know, the level of hop flavor between the two is, is pretty similar. So I think the Holmes one just has maybe a little bit more of a kind of complex blend of hop flavors in it, which I like. As far as mouthfeel in the two, they're actually pretty similar, which is interesting because the Holmes one is 6.2%, where mine was only 4.3%. So overall, yeah, I think I like the Holmes one just a little better. I think I like the mix of hops. Yeah, I think I like the blending of the hops. It's got a little bit more of a tropical note to it. But they're both very similar beers, and they're both very good. I would definitely be up for brewing this. I'm really happy with how it turned out being uh, an extract-based partial mash beer. So something in the back of my mind that I'm thinking about working on coming up with is a really nice stovetop extract-based New England IPA. Something like a first-time brewer. I see a lot of people that really want to brew New England IPAs, but they're not easy beers to brew. If you could brew one extract on your stove, I think that would be awesome. So if you're interested in learning more about the Brave Noise Pale Ale or the Brave Noise Effort, check out some of the links in my description. Also, check out this playlist for other brewers, some of them that have brewed the exact same recipe. See how it turned out. Also, check out some of my other content. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you click that button. That way you can find your way back to my future content. Cheers, and here's to a great 2022.